Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Mark. I'm um, one of the clergy here at St. James. Um, over the past few weeks, we've been going through the, the book of Romans. You'll know that. But for the last uh, Sunday of the month, we normally take a sidestep away from that, from the usual teaching program, to look at an interesting question. And this week, or this month rather, as Chris mentioned, we're thinking about the question, can Jesus make me happy? Now, we're going to start by looking at a passage in the Bible. We're looking at Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 23. Whilst we're turning that page up, I will pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in your word, in the Bible, we hear the voice of Jesus. So by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take the words that I read and the words that I will preach afterwards and you will embed those in our hearts that we might be changed to be more like the Lord Jesus. In his name and for his glory we pray. Amen. So Mark chapter 10 and reading from verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go. Go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So our question this evening, can Jesus make me happy? And if you were listening to that reading carefully, you might be thinking, Mark, you've sabotaged yourself here because you've got a story with an encounter. A man has an encounter with Jesus. He has a serious conversation with him. And at the end of it, the man's face falls and he goes away sad. We need to come back to that a bit later on. But why this question? We're going to do some thinking first, and then in the last third, we'll come back to this passage. But why this question? Can Jesus make me happy? I think it's fair to say that happiness is fundamental to the way that we live our lives. F happiness is a motivation for what we do and how we live. Blaise Pascal, 17th century French mathematician and philosopher and Christian, said this, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. We want to be happy. We want to be happy. Now, there are two things I've got to say to help clear the ground. Firstly, Happiness, it's a bit of a fluffy word. It's even, you know, maybe even a bit of a naff word. Does Jesus want me to be happy? Um, some people might even use, um, describe churches with contemporary music as happy clappy, and it seems to be a bit of a derogative term for that. Um, so you might prefer to use the word, can Jesus make me happy? You might prefer the word joy. Can Jesus make me joyful? Can Jesus make me content? Um, I'm not making a huge distinction between those things. 
Because we're talking about the positive emotion in happiness, the, the thing that we want to feel. And whether that feeling is something which is, um, whether we're very outwardly demonstrative and it's very visible in our face, or whether that happiness is joy deep, deep, deep down in our hearts. We're talking about that, that emotion that we want to feel that's positive. But all the statistics, all the research that's out there being done say that most people, a lot of people, don't feel that. I don't feel happy. Now, it's not saying that they, we, are never happy, but that that happiness that we have is it's short-lived. It doesn't last. We're not living content lives. So can Jesus help with that? So happiness, bit of a naff word, but it brings in lots of things. Second thing to get out of the way. <laughs> you might be here, and it might, you might be new to St. James, you might be new to Christian things, and you might be thinking, Mark, seriously, are Christians the best people to tell me about being happiness? You might think, Christianity hasn't had the best track record at making people feel happy because Christianity is about rules and regulations, and it's always been that way. And whenever anyone ever used to watch horrible histories, horrible histories, you might remember the Puritans, group of people, very serious, very serious about their faith, very serious about Christianity. And in that program, and indeed in lots of um, cultural things since then, the Puritans were, portray were portrayed as killjoys. Their Christianity was a no-fun Christianity, um, no fun for themselves, and a desire for no one else to have fun. Now, that's actually very unfair. It's actually very unfair criticism of, of the Puritans. It's not accurate, but that's the impression that's given. That's the image that's given. Can, so can Christians really tell us about happiness? Well, you know what I'm going to say. Now, let me get, now I've got those two things out of the way. I want to build a case to show why, to show, yes, Jesus can make me happy. And I've got three arguments. First thing, first thing, which might be a bit of a surprise to some of you, and that is to say that religion can help. Religion definitely helps. Um, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that some kind of belief in God, that practicing a religion is beneficial to your health. People who regularly attend uh, churches, retain, regularly attend a, a kind of a worship service, are generally more optimistic, have lower rates of depression, they're less likely take, to take their own lives, less likely to divorce, they're likely to display more self-control. And these are findings um, from detailed, peer-reviewed academic studies. This wasn't a poll on Facebook or Twitter. And when it comes to Christianity, that's not surprising. It's not surprising. Re Rebecca McLaughlin, who's a Christian author, wrote this fantastic book, Confronting Christianity. Um, in her chapter, opening chapter, Aren't we better off without religion? She took seven key biblical principles and lined them up with what social psychologists have been saying about what's good for us. So it turns out that things that Christians practice and believe, things like, as it's listed up there, um, generosity of time, generosity in their money, having a clear calling for work, um, contentment in all situations, practicing gratitude, practicing forgiveness, exercising self-control, being persever um, perseverance, all of those things which are biblical principles, they have positive effects on us and on society around us. Throw into the mix community and relationship and even a bit of good old singing all together and it's a good start. But is that distinctively Christian? 
Do you have to be a Christian to do those things? And it's true that you can find some of those things in other religions. Being generous with your money, knowing how to restrain yourselves. You can find something in the teachings of Hinduism and Islam. Being in community. Does it have to be a church? You can do that by gathering together with other people who share the same outlook, who are working together for some other social cause. Now, before some of you get angry and think, Mark, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're hijacking this talk. Um, we're going to have to think, where does the power to do those things come from? Where's the power going to come from to do those things consistently? To give generously, consistently. To forgive other people consistently. Or even, where does the strength come from to start doing those things again when we failed? If you were here last week when Chris was preaching on um, Romans 7, we remember that actually one of the things that really can get us down, one of the things which can really rob us of our, of our happiness is when we don't do what we know we should be doing. It can rob us of our happiness. How do, we, how do we get back if it's all down to us? So, religion can help, but will it last? Second part of the argument. Where does happiness come from? What's the origin of happiness? Now think about the kind of places where people try and find happiness today. Think about the places that we maybe have or are currently looking for happiness. And in some ways, it's the same usual list. Wealth, love, family, good career, meaningful friendships. Maybe we think those are things that will give us long-term happiness. But also, maybe when we were younger, we look for happiness in moments, in an evening, a good night out, great party, alcohol, drugs, casual encounters, Things that can give people a high, a temporary high, and then there's a come down afterwards. Adam Peaty. Adam Peaty, you might recognize him. Olympic gold medalist, um, 100 meter breaststroke, um, swimming in the final in ooh, maybe a couple of hours' time. He's won gold medals, worked hard for them. Tirelessly, but he suffered from problems, alcohol problems, depression. This is what he said back in February. He said, sport is not the real world. I spent most of my life kind of validating, getting my gratification, getting my life's fulfillment from my results. And that led me to some dark moments. And it's really living your life on a quantifiable measure of results, 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 instead of how are the people around me? How am I? How is my son? How's my family? How all those things actually do matter. It's not about your, it's not about your job. It's not just about performance. See, Adam would openly admit that he found, he was trying to find his deepest meaning and his joy from his career. And maybe he then, he would resonate with these words that were found in the Bible. Because it's nothing new here. The author of the book of Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament book, did a whole life experiment. And he said this, this is in the opening chapter, or the second chapter. He said, yet when I had surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. So where does happiness come from? Find another group of people and talk about happiness, and they will talk about chemicals in the brain. Serotonin, dopamine, 
oxytocin. I don't think we want to be dependent on that, living our lives reliant on that. Now, hear me out for a second. There are certainly some people who, who take medication for de- depression, and I'm not against that. But the way that we live our lives, the way that we desire life, we, we feel that that deep joy, or that deep joy that we're searching for, is more than just a chemical imbalance. So maybe if we knew then where happiness comes from, that would help. Psalm 16, verse 11, the writer of the psalm says this, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Eternal pleasures at your right hand. You see, there's something here about being close to God. Something here about being in proximity to God that brings happiness. Or there's something in who God is that overflows to us. If you've ever read through the Gospels, the the biographies, as it were, of the life of Jesus, particularly in John's Gospel, Jesus makes extraordinary claims about himself. Claims which, if we are to take seriously in belief, show that he never thought he was just a good teacher dispensing wisdom. Jesus said things like, I'm the bread of life. I'm the living water. I'm the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. See, it's not that Jesus merely shares love and life and wisdom in the same way that if we share some, of, some things for ourselves that we have less for us now that we've given to someone else. No. And it's not saying that Jesus passes on joy and peace, that Jesus passes on something that he's obtained somewhere else and gives it to us. No, all of those attributes, the love, the peace, the joy, the contentment, they radiate from him. They flow out of him in an unceasing manner. Why? Because he is those things. Jesus is the source. Now, all of that can seem a bit hypothetical. It's just a bit hypothetical. But look at Jesus' life. Again, go back to the Gospels. If you've never done it before, we can happily give you a a Gospel, a short biography of Jesus' life. And you realize when you read through that, in all of the interactions that Jesus has with different people, he's completely at ease with himself. He is, as they say, you know, kind of happy in his own skin. And that doesn't mean Jesus is one-dimensional. Jesus is not one-dimensional in the sense that he's happy and he's got this kind of plastic grin on his face. Jesus knew what it meant to feel sorrow, to feel grief. Jesus cries. Jesus gets angry at injustice. Jesus gets angry at the effects of sin. But he's happy. I love the fact that so many times in the Gospels, we read about Jesus eating with people. Jesus has perfected the ministry of hanging out. Not just with his disciples, not just with his friends, but he he spends time, he hangs out with the outcasts, with the rejects, and with the Pharisees too. In fact, Jesus spends so much time happily mixing with ordinary people that some people labelled him a drunkard and a glutton. I love this quote. There's a quote coming up on the screen from George Whitfield, who was a preacher in the the 18th century. This is just an edited bit. Let me read the full thing. Does Jesus want your heart only for the same end as the devil does? That is, to make you miserable? No. He only wants you to believe on him that you might be saved. This, 
This is all the dear Savior desires, to make you happy, that you may leave your sins, to sit down eternally with him at the marriage supper of the land. Does Jesus want to make us miserable? No. No wants to make us happy, but that involves letting go of something. Can Jesus make us happy? Well, where have we got to so far? We've said that practicing religion can help with happiness, but it might be just a temporary thing because ultimately, Jesus can definitely provide happiness. Why? Because that is who he is. He is the source of all joy. But then there's one more thing, final thing. What will it take for us to receive that happiness from Jesus? And for that, we need to go back to that encounter, back to that Bible reading, where a man meets Jesus and leaves sad, walks away sad after meeting with him. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to look in depth at this passage. That wasn't a 20-minute introduction for, another, for a 20-minute talk. But just think about what I've already said. This man has all the the raw ingredients to be happy. It's a passage, it's it's an encounter which which is also described in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's um, gospel. In Matthew's description, um, we find out that this is a young man. This is someone who has the vitality of youth. Luke adds to this that he's a ruler. So this is somebody with authority and power and influence. And I don't know if you spotted it, he's religious. He knows the commandments and he says he's obeying them. But this man knows that there's something missing and that's why he comes to Jesus This man is looking for eternal life. And by that, I don't think he he means simply an earthly existence which just goes on and on and on where you just get older and older and older. Maybe this man isn't entirely sure what he wants, but in any case, he comes to Jesus. And it's Jesus who defines what eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing God, living in God's love, being energized by God's spirit, walking in his ways. And eternal life is not something that starts after you die. It begins in the here and now. And this man comes to Jesus and he knows that Jesus has an answer to his question, but he doesn't quite believe that Jesus is the answer to it doesn't trust Jesus enough for eternal life. I don't think, well, sorry. I think it's too simplistic to say that this man was simply greedy for his own wealth. Because that lets everyone else off the hook who's not wealthy. Something bigger at stake here. See, this rich young man thought that his wealth was at the heart of his happiness. And for someone else, for us here in this room, the key to our happiness might be not our wealth, but our career, our prospects, the hope of getting married, our dare I say it, good looks, our health, having kids who are successful. Is that where our happiness, is that where our hope for happiness is? Now, none of those things are kind of inherently bad in themselves, but if we rely on them to make us happy, we will be disappointed. Why? Well, we grow older, we lose our looks, definitely the case of some of us already, lost our good health, we may not be able to have children, and even if we do have children, they're not necessarily going to follow the nightly path that we would have had for them. Our career doesn't work out, and it may come to an end. So where does the happiness then? And effectively, Jesus says to the man, will you give up your wealth for your happiness? 
Will you surrender it? Because you believe that what I have to offer is greater. And it's what Jesus is saying to us all this evening. Will we be willing to surrender our freedom and surrender, as it were, what our dream was for happiness to experience a deeper joy, a lasting commitment, a lasting contentment that starts right here and right now? See, what Jesus doing is that he's subverting our expectation of happiness. He's turning it on its head. Again, throughout the Gospels, there is this pattern. If you want life, you've got to give it away. If you want to live, you have to be prepared to die. If you want to be happy, truly happy, to know God's eternal joy, then you first need to mourn. You first need to mourn and feel the grief that you are a sinner who's rejected God's ways. It's what I've done. It's what I continue to do. Many of us here have done that and need to keep doing that. Believe it's what Adam Peaty himself has done. It's another quote going to experience up on the screen. See, Adam was searching and came across a, a guy who spent a lot of time with Olympic athletes, particularly Olympic swimmers, uh, a remarkable uh, Christian called Ashley Knoll. And as a result of spending time and reading God's word and doing little Bible studies and going to church, this is what he said. He said, if this, talking about church, a relationship with Jesus, if this isn't, if this isn't meant for me, then I don't know what is. Because I don't think society has the answers, especially as a young man, the answers I'm seeking. Are we seeking for those answers? Are we willing to mourn our sin? Because that's not the end. There is the rejoicing which comes. The rejoicing that comes from knowing that the slate, it's not just that the slate is wiped clean, but that we get filled with Jesus. We can be filled with the Spirit. And he will work in us to produce the happiness we desire. Can Jesus make me happy? Of course he can. Do we want that happiness? Are we willing to surrender our freedom? Are we willing to listen to him for what his happiness is? Are we willing to kind of go deeper into it? If that's you, if you're thinking about that, then come and have a, have a chat with me or Chris at the end of the service. Love to be able to talk further, maybe to pray with you. Let's just take a moment now of quiet before I lead us in a prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise you as the source of all joy. Thank you that you are joy and happiness in yourself and that when we are close to you, when we are united to you by faith, that overflows into our lives. Pray for anyone maybe who's struggling with this, that they can come to know the hope and the freedom and indeed, yeah, that joy of being in a right relationship with you. I thank you that there are people here in this room who can testify to that, that you are the one who drew them out of a dark place like Adam P.T. and placed them on a, on, on a firm rock to stand. Thank you that is something that we can keep turning back to you again and again. 
Thank you that we can be filled with your spirit. We can be filled with your life and that can overflow to others as well. Help us to surrender our lives to you, to surrender our freedoms for your great, your greatest happiness and your greatest joy to those pleasures, eternal pleasures at your right hand. We ask all of this in your precious name. Amen.